Hello and welcome to Church at Home with Rachel. My name is Rachel Parker. I am the Anglican priest at the parish of St. Thomas in Wainwright and St. Mary's in Edgerton in the Diocese of Edmonton in southeastern Alberta in Canada. My pronouns are her, she, her, and hers. And it is my pleasure to be chatting with you today. For those of you who have been paying attention for a while, I've been reading this book. I only read it for about 10 minutes a day. I just take like over coffee, just read a few pages and then get to think about it. But well, it's called Christianity for the Rest of Us, How the Neighborhood Church is Transforming the Faith by Diana Butler Bass. And I read this this morning and it really struck me. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read this to you. More than any other biblical character, American Protestants venerate the Apostle Paul. Because of Paul's special place in the American pantheon of saints, Americans have long cherished dramatic conversion stories. Beginning with the great colonial revivals, we have celebrated spiritual change through encountering God in Jesus. Generations of people walked the sawdust trail to give their lives to Jesus, making their way to the front of revival tents and churches to get born again. American Christianity has often been a road to Damascus sort of religion, full of instantaneous, miraculous, and complete personal conversions. This American interpretation of Paul, however, misses something in the biblical story. After the powerful encounter on the road, which leaves him blind, Paul is rescued by some Christians who take him to the city and heal his blindness. He says that he went away at once to Arabia, where for three years he learned about Jesus and his way. Only after this intense time of reflection, prayer, and preparation was Paul ready to engage in public his new calling of being the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul may have been stopped in his tracks on the road to Damascus, but it took three years of living in Christian community and learning its practices for him to be fully changed. Even the biblical story, with all its breathless enthusiasm, regards change as a process that happens in a community of practice. That really struck me because I kind of live in a world and have for a long time where people pay a lot more attention to Paul sometimes than they do to the red letter words of Jesus. Um, in case you're not understanding what I mean by red letter words, um, it comes from two different places. In, I don't know about other denominations, but in the Anglican church, that's where I'm from, um, there are things called rubrics, red letters, um, things that are written like, um, they're not really rules, but there's like instructions in our prayer book that were written in red letters. And they highlight, they set them about, apart so that they were things to pay close attention to. So the rubrics, the, the way that we do things and why we do them. But then, of course, there were also the red letter Bibles, the Bibles that would take everything that Jesus said and put them in red, which is great if you're trying to find what Jesus said. Not so great if you're trying to learn what the totality of the context of what Jesus said is or was. You see, if you only go through and quote the words that are written in red, you end up proof texting, taking things that Jesus said without listening to or paying attention to the people he was talking to, the circumstances he was in. You know, you don't hear that he, you know, if you only read the words that were written in red that he said, that the words that Jesus said, for instance, in the passage where he is, a woman is brought to him, a woman who has been caught lying with a man, who is brought to him in unceremoniously dumped before him and the, 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 the pious elders of the community are saying, what are you going to do about her? You should stone her. You know, they're going to stone her because she was caught in an, adulter in an adulterous situation. Forget that the fact that she couldn't do that by herself, you know. Anyway, the story for a different day. Um, but Jesus didn't say a lot. It says, the Bible says he started sort of tracing in the sand. We don't know what words he wrote, if he wrote any words, what he was doing in the sand. But by basically it was that the, the, he said, let he is who without sin cast the first stone. And eventually he looked up and said, well, where'd they go? Because they all wandered away. They all knew they were they were not without sin. So if we only paid attention to the words that Jesus said without paying attention to the context within which he said it, we miss out on everything. And uh, so I get a little, I get a little nervous when people start talking about what Jesus said, because a lot of his ministry came out more in what he did than what he actually said. But 
I, I digress. There's a lot of people out there who really focus on Paul, the Pauline letters. So Romans and Corinthians and Thessalonians and Timothy and all of it. Bec and the reason they do that is because there's so much of it. And, and Paul wrote about lots of things and to lots of, lots of people. There's a lot there to work with. The Gospels have a limited period of time. They're talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are talking about a, a, a time span of essentially just three years of Jesus' ministry, where Paul is talking about almost a generation or two. Like he's, he covers a lot of distance, he covers a lot of time. So there's more to work with with Paul. The problem is, though, is that we don't worship Paul. We recognize Jesus Christ as our Savior. So for people to, to, to hang all their hopes on Paul, I get, a little, I get a little itchy with that. The other thing is, is we tend to, and I do it myself, we tend to think about Paul having that Damascus Road experiences, experience where he hears Jesus' voice and, and Jesus saying to him, like, Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And when he realizes who it is that he's talking to, these scales form in his eyes and he's blind and he's taken away by friends and a couple of days later he is healed and he can now see. And we forget the fact that he took some time to go and learn about who this Jesus was, to live in Christian community, live with people who knew Jesus, who understood his teachings and who wanted to, to really live the new, the new way um, keep in mind that this was not a Christian way yet. At the beginning of, um, of this time period, um, Jesus was a good Jew who had died and was believed to have been resurrected and ascended to heaven. And so this whole new group of people were Jewish peoples and Gentiles who believed in Jesus. And the idea or the title of Christians, little Christ, came later on. But Paul didn't just automatically go from, you know, scales in his eyes, being conv convicted of of being a real SOB to people and going to change my ways immediately, bang. He's, you know, the new hero, the Apostle Paul out there, you know, big cape with the letter P on it for, you know, yay Jesus. It took time. It took him time to unlearn what he had done and known and to learn this new way of being to learn what it meant to be part of a body, a group of people who believed in something that was really so unbelievable, um, and yet they believed. And then from that time of learning, from that time when he was away from the crowd at Jerusalem, then he is able to come back and he teach and had a prolific career, like spent, spent years um, in and out of prison and you know, getting convicted of, of many things and people trying to kill him and all that stuff. Lots of sailing and all kinds of adventures. We could probably make a great cartoon or a um, you know, Saturday morning um, Adventures with St. Paul um, cartoon for kids. Um, but Paul had to have time in community. And there, there, I sometimes think that there is such, a, especially now, with this idea that, that our, our politics are wrapped up in our, in our faith and, and vice versa, I think there's, there seems to be a real frenzy, I think that's a good word, a frenzy, that we, that we need to, 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 we need to go and get people to, you know, to convert to Christ, and we need them to see the truth, and we need them then to be vocal, and to go out and convert other people. Um, with no rec recognition that if someone does come to understand Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that, that they're developing a relationship. And I don't know about you, but I don't know very many people who fell in love at first sight and then dove into a relationship and have lived the rest of their lives completely, you know, without any problems and with no issues with somebody that they barely knew. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes, indeed, it does happen. But for the most part, when we come into a relationship with somebody else, we have to get to know them. You know, you go out for coffee, you meet, you meet him or her in a safe place. You know, a lot of meeting up now is happening online with eHarmony and you know, all those, those match.com things. And so we're always warned, you know, if you meet somebody for the first time, do so in public, in a public place. So say you go to Starbucks or Tim Hortons or Dunkin' Donuts or something to sit down for your first coffee and, and you give yourself 45 minutes, enough time to, you know, have a coffee and maybe a refill and not too much that if you really don't like the person you're talking to, that you feel like you're trapped, but at the same time, long enough that you think you get a sense of whether you want to meet up again. 
And once you've done that, then, then you enter into that, like, well, let's go on a date. Maybe we'll go for a walk someplace or a bike ride, or maybe we'll go out for dinner. Again, public place where people can see you and you feel safe. And eventually then, as you get to know each other and see what you have in common and what you don't have in common, the things that they can teach you and you can teach them, the things that, that they'll expose you to and the things you expose them to, the things you're interested in or not, as you get to know each other, and the deeper into the relationship you become, the more you can trust one another. And when you trust someone, that's when you can dive all in. That's when you can say, okay, you know what? I'm ready to have a real, earnest, long-term commitment relationship with this person. Well, I think the same thing happens usually with Jesus. When people are thinking about, do I believe in him? I'm not suggesting that we can somehow miraculously sit down with Jesus at a Starbucks and have that first conversation, but we can have that conversation with someone else who has a relationship with him. And maybe that's, you know, to get started, like just to be gentle and say, you know what, I, I don't necessarily believe that part or I don't understand that or my heart's not there yet. And then, you know, coffee turns into a bike ride or a walk in the park. It turns into a, a, a dinner and a movie and it turns into you know, getting together first thing on Saturday morning and realizing that it's supper time, you're still hanging out together. And you may not agree on everything, but you're willing to work through the disagreements and you're willing to say, okay, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but I like this part. That kind of, 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 of developing a relationship with someone who has a relationship with Christ is a great way to come to know Christ, to come to know Jesus. And the sense that we have to sort of have these instant conversions and then you're then there you're committed um yeah for some people it happens but for most of us it's more like like i sort of suggested it's more like a dating relationship where you're one step at a time and you're coming to know in community so if you are someone who is thinking about the christian faith or heck any faith um anything like this take some time don't feel pressured don't feel like you got to do it now. Um, take your time. Wander into it. Um, a, a phrase, a phrase that um, came up was, um, I'll, I'll talk about that different phrase from Tourist to Pilgrims. I'll talk about that another time. Um, but just this idea that we need to, we don't need to go fast. We can take our time. God's going to wait for us. If indeed you are called to be in a relationship, if you're called to become a believer in Jesus, he's not putting any time, time, time restraints on you. He's not saying, you know, take this order in the next 12 minutes or you'll lose it forever. This is something that you can take your time with. And you need to be in community. You need to be with other people who can talk to you, whether it's a church community or a Bible study group or a, just a group of people who, who like to talk about things like that. I encourage you to take your time. And just listen, ask all kinds of questions. It, God will never, I believe that God and Jesus will never be upset with us if we ask all those questions that are on our hearts. I think like anyone who loves us, um, Jesus would much rather have us be honest about our doubts and our questions and be, you know, completely open to us saying, you know, this is where I'm struggling. This is where I, I can only go so far in believing you, but I can't quite make it the next, over the next hurdle. I think that he would much rather we be honest about that than hold it back and pretend. Um, so if you're along a Christian journey, if you're, you're asking questions about Jesus or any faith, as I said, take your time. Seek out people who maybe are further along the journey than you are, that you trust, that you trust, and ask them to maybe walk with you for a little while. Because like Paul, it may have been an instant conversion, but his journey into sharing that conversion with others did indeed take some time. So no one is expecting that you drop to your knees and give yourself to Jesus right now, unless you feel called to do that. But I am encouraging you that if you feel called to wonder about him and ask questions and maybe try to have a relationship with him, go for it. Just be gentle with yourself and be patient. God will not quit on you. Don't quit on him. Just, just some things to think about. Have a great day. God bless you. And I will see you again tomorrow, Friday, for Church at Home with Rachel.